Welcome to section 42 of bacteria. This is our bacteria overview figure. In this video, we'll be discussing Mycobacterium leprae, which you can see right here. This scene will take place in the wild where we can see some leopards up on a hill. Leopards sounds like leprae, so these leopards should help you remember that this image is all about Mycobacterium leprae. To help you remember that this is an acid fast organism, we've shown this scene occurring in an area affected by acid rain. Notice that we've included a gross, dark rain cloud that has clearly destroyed the trees below it. So acid rain for acid fast bacillus. Next, notice that we've shown a mangy looking poacher guy that's illegally trying to kill these endangered leopards. He drove up here with his car, and now we can see that he has placed a bunch of bombs in the back of the trunk. I guess he uses the bombs to kill the leopards. Pretty messed up if you ask me. Anyway, the car with the bombs inside of it is here to help you remember carbol fusion. Like we discussed in prior videos, this is a red staining reagent that's used as one of the steps in the acid fast stain. Now we've shown a deputy at the top of the hill who has been tracking this poacher guy for some time now. As you can see, he's using a microphone to tell the poacher guy that he's under arrest for illegally killing animals. In any case, just like in our other videos, the microphone is here to help you remember that mycolic acid is present in the cell wall of Mycobacterium leprae. The high mycolic acid concentration in the cell wall is partially responsible for the appearance of the organism when stained with the acid fast stain. This is an acid fast stain of Mycobacterium leprae. You can see that there are many red appearing organisms, for example, right here. Okay, now notice that we've added an armadillo to the scene. If you look closely, you can see that the poor animal has a dart stuck in its back. In a moment, you'll understand why. Anyway, the armadillo is here to help you remember that armadillos are reservoirs for Mycobacterium leprae in the US. All right, now take a close look at the snow-covered mountain peaks. These snow-covered mountains are here to help you remember that Mycobacterium leprae prefers cool temperatures, which is why it infects superficial nerves and the skin. To help you remember that it causes nerve infections, notice that we've shown a guy with prominent red gloves on. This guy is a researcher and works here with the animals. He's the one responsible for the dart in the armadillo's back. Anyway, the red gloves are here to help you remember that Mycobacterium leprae causes superficial nerve infections, resulting in a glove and stocking loss of sensation. So red gloves for glove and stocking loss of sensation. If you look at the ground next to him, you can see that he's dropped a petri dish. He was taking a sample of blood from the armadillo, but accidentally dropped it. A petri dish is used to grow things in vitro, so the fact that this petri dish is getting broken should help you remember that Mycobacterium leprae cannot be grown in vitro. The researcher guy got the sample of blood in the first place by temporarily paralyzing the armadillo with that dart. The dart is kind of similar to instruments used to obtain a biopsy. So we've included the dart here to help you remember that a skin biopsy is obtained to assist with making the diagnosis. Next, notice that we've shown the armadillo enclosed in this area by the chain link fence. Just like in our other videos, the chains on the chain link fence represent polymerase chain reaction. So Mycobacterium leprae can also be diagnosed using polymerase chain reaction. All right, now let's move on to discuss the two forms of leprosy, the lepromatous form and the tuberculoid form. The mechanism and immune response are actually pretty high yield and somewhat complicated, so perhaps it would be best if we walk through this logically first using this diagram, and then afterwards I'll help you memorize these details with the image mnemonic. The response to Mycobacterium leprae is somewhat similar to Mycobacterium tuberculosis, so you can see that this diagram is similar to the one that we used in the last video. First, the pathogen enters the host, so we can see Mycobacterium leprae at the top of the image right here. It's a little uncertain, but it's thought that this occurs through respiratory droplets, but it may also occur through the skin. Regardless, the organism enters the host, is engulfed by a macrophage, and then the antigen is presented to naive T cells. So right here, we stated that the antigens are presented to naive T cells. During this time, the pathogen continues to proliferate intracellularly because a macrophage is unable to successfully eliminate the pathogen until it's fully activated by a proper immune response. Next, notice that it's at this point in the immune response that will determine if the patient develops the tuberculoid form of leprosy or the lepromatous form of leprosy. Normally, a strong immune response will induce T helper type 1 cells to release interferon gamma, which will then fully activate macrophages. Here, the macrophages can destroy the pathogen via phagolysosome fusion and can successfully contain it via granuloma formation. So notice that we've stated that if this occurs, there is successful intracellular destruction and granuloma formation. As you can likely deduce, the tuberculoid form of leprosy is associated with a low bacterial load and the patient usually only develops minor symptoms such as hairless skin plaques. Alternatively, if the patient's immune response is weak, then it will attempt to activate Th1 cells, but because this is unable to occur, it's left to activate Th2 cells, even though this is not ideal. So you can see that Th2 cells are activated right here. 
The exact reasons for this and the mechanism are complicated and beyond the scope of step one. However, ultimately, IL-4 is secreted and B-cells are activated, which then secrete antibodies. However, because the pathogen is intracellular, antibodies are unable to successfully be eliminated. So you can see that we stated that antibodies are unable to destroy the intracellular pathogen. As you can likely deduce, the lepromatous form of leprosy is associated with a high bacterial load, and the patient usually develops diffuse skin lesions. This often affects the face, and when this occurs, it's known as leonine facies. Okay, now that you hopefully logically understand the mechanism, let's help you memorize these details. To represent the lepromatous form, we've added two more leopards to the image. As you can see, they're pretty lazy, just laying on the ground munching on some greens. So, lazy leopards for lepromatous form. The fact that they are lazy should help you remember that the lepromatous form is associated with a weak immune system. Also, we've shown two leopards to help you remember that in this form of leprosy, there is a T helper type 2 cell response rather than a T helper type 1 cell response. So the lepromatous form is associated with a weak immune response and T helper type 2 cells are activated. As we discussed a moment ago, the pathogens are unable to be successfully destroyed, so there is a high bacterial load. To help you remember this, we've shown the two leopards higher up on a hill that's covered with a ton of green mold. So high up on the hill and covered with mold for the lepromatous form is associated with a high bacterial load. To help you remember that the lepromatous form can cause leonine facies, we've shown a wild lion getting ready to pounce on these lazy leopards. So lion for leonine facies. This is an image of leonine facies, and as you can see, this individual has skin lesions on her face, resulting in thickened facial features that's thought to resemble that of a lion. Next, notice that we've added a skull right next to the lazy leopards. Perhaps this is the skull of one of the lion's previous meals. In any case, the skull is here to help you remember that the lepromatous form can be lethal. All right, now that we've covered the lepromatous form, let's move on to discuss the tuberculoid form. To represent this, we've shown our poacher guy with a big tubercle on the back of his head. You may have thought his head looked a bit odd, and now you know why. So tubercle on his head for tuberculoid form. Now notice that we've shown a leopard in a cage. The cage is a symbol for the macrophage, and the leopard is a symbol for Mycobacterium leprae. So with this symbolism in mind, Hopefully you can see that the tuberculoid form exhibits a strong immune response, ultimately containing and destroying the pathogen, just like this leopard is contained by the cage. The fact that there is only one leopard in the cage should help you remember that in this form of leprosy, there is a T helper type 1 cell response, rather than a T helper type 2 cell response. So the tuberculoid form is associated with a strong immune response and T helper type 1 cells are activated. Because the pathogen is successfully contained and destroyed, the tuberculoid form is associated with a low bacterial load. To help you remember this, we've shown the guy with the tubercle and the leopard in the cage down on a lower area of the image. We've also only shown a little bit of green mold on the ground compared to the hill up higher that's completely covered in green mold. So the tuberculoid form is associated with a low bacterial load. Did you notice that our poacher villain guy has a pretty interesting hairdo? Look at those patches of hair on top of his mostly bald head. We've intentionally made him look this way to help you remember that the tuberculoid form is associated with hairless skin plaques. Okay, now let's move on to discuss treatment. Remember the deputy guy up here that's been chasing the poacher? Let's zoom up on him so you can see him better. As you can see, the deputy looks pretty official, with his star on his shirt and rifle. Anyway, deputy sounds like dapsone, so this should help you remember that dapsone is used to treat both forms of leprosy the lepromatous form, and the tuberculoid form. Also, rifle has been used before to represent rifampin, so the fact that he has a rifle should help you remember that rifampin is used to treat both forms of leprosy. Finally, notice that one of the lazy leopards is eating a clover. Clover sounds like clofazamine, so the clover should help you remember this drug. The fact that only the lazy leopard is eating the clover should help you remember that this drug is only used to treat the lepromatous form of leprosy. So just to be clear, both forms of leprosy are treated with rifampin and dapsone, and then clofazamine is added for patients who have the lepromatous form. All right, now that we've covered the image, let's review with a question. A 41-year-old male who recently immigrated from Nigeria comes to the office due to a skin lesion on his head. He states that he first noticed the area a few weeks ago. Physical examination reveals a hypoesthetic, hypopigmented lesion on the right side of the patient's forehead. Adjacent to the lesion is an area of baldness extending several centimeters into his hairline. A biopsy is obtained and light microscopy reveals numerous pathogens invading the nerve tissue. Which of the following is true regarding this patient's condition? A. There is an abundance of Th2 cells in response to the infection. B. The cell wall of the pathogen contains many long fatty acids. C. The causal organism prefers warm temperatures. Or D. IL-4 is the cytokine involved in this immune response. Okay, hopefully from the question stem you notice that this patient is from Nigeria 
and is presenting with a hypoesthetic, hypopigmented lesion, as well as with an area of baldness. These lesions are specific for the tuberculoid form of leprosy. Also, light microscopy revealed the pathogen invading the nerve tissue. Recall that Mycobacterium leprae invades the skin and nerves, so we can conclude that this is most likely Mycobacterium leprae. With this in mind, the correct answer is B. The cell wall of the pathogen contains many long fatty acids. This is describing mycolic acid. From the image, recall that the deputy's microphone right here is here to help you remember that the cell wall of Mycobacterium leprae contains mycolic acid and is partially responsible for the appearance of the organism when stained with the acid fast stain. A is incorrect because this patient has the tuberculoid form of leprosy, which is characterized by a Th1 response, not a Th2 response. If we return to this image, you can see that the tuberculoid form elicits a Th1 response, whereas the lepromatous form elicits a Th2 response. So again, A is incorrect. C is wrong because the organism prefers cool temperatures, not warm temperatures. Recall that this is why the organism infects the skin and nerve tissue, so C is incorrect. Finally, D is wrong because IL-4 promotes B cell activation, which is seen in the lepromatous form of leprosy. However, this patient has the tuberculoid form of leprosy, so interferon gamma is released, which activates macrophages. So D is incorrect. So again, the correct answer is B. The cell wall of the pathogen contains many long fatty acids. And with that, you've learned everything you need to know about Mycobacterium leprae.